Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And in this video, I wanted to introduce what speckle imaging was and then what lucky imaging is, which is actually a version of speckle imaging in astronomy. So when you're taking pictures of stars, maybe you're trying to find an exoplanet near to a star as well, which actually this technique can be used for, then this is a good way to actually get better resolution. So if you're imaging through the atmosphere, which most of us are, if we're kind of doing our own astronomy, then we're going to be fighting with atmospheric turbulence. And it, because, well, it causes our stars to become distorted like this here. And if you take very short exposure images and you create this kind of video here, then you'll find that the star kind of wanders around a little bit. You'll get multiple images being formed. So you get this atmospheric turbulence being caused. And this is kind of what causes the stars to appear to twinkle as well. So if we take a single image of that, we're not going to get anything useful out of that. We're not going to get a single point of light. But interestingly, this is not a single star anyway. This is actually a binary star. And you can't pick out the two stars there because it's wandering all over the place. And it's also producing multiple multiple images. It's getting bright one region and it's moving somewhere else. So we need a better technique to get rid of that. Now there are a few ways around that. We can't all put a telescope into space though. So one way around it is to put a telescope into space. We're then not fighting with the atmosphere. And you can see some of these images we can get from space-based telescopes are fantastic because you're just not looking through the atmosphere there anymore. But we can't put telescopes in space all the time. There's only a limited amount there and it's easier, cheaper to build them on the ground. Now, one way you can do that is with active and adaptive optics. So once you get to a certain size mirror, the mirrors themselves actually start to sag and kind of become flexible and you need to compensate for that. So you need to actually flex the mirror to get its shape back again. And you can also flex that mirror to directly compensate for that distortion of the light you're getting from that star or that object as well. So what you actually do here, so that with adaptive optics and that you'd create a laser in the sky, it causes a reference star, which you would know how bright it should be, you know what it should look like, and you monitor that, and then you bend your mirror to remove that distortion, and then your science image, your star, or whatever you're looking at, will appear much better, much higher resolution, because you're compensating for that distortion by bending the mirror. And on the, the left here, you can see at the top, you've got your reference star and your science image. So you've created that reference star of your laser. Now, the wavefront would normally be um, kind of flat planar as it's coming from the star. But as it enters the atmosphere, you've got that localized turbulence and it distorts that wavefront. And when it gets to us, it's quite distorted, which causes the star to basically wander around a bit. Now at the very bottom of that, you would have a deformable mirror. So you'd have actuators there, which would bend that mirror. We know what's happening to that reference star and you can compensate for it. And you can get pretty good images from the ground by doing that. It's obviously expensive. We can't really do that in our own garden or anything like that. And on the right there, you've got the actuators of the active optics for the GTC, which is the largest mirrored telescope on the planet in La Palma. So what do you actually see with that? Well, this is with the, the Keck Observatory, and on the left, you've got no adaptive optics. So that's how you would see it without any adaptive optics being uh, used. And on the left, you've actually got the galactic center with adaptive optics switched on. And you can see your angular resolution is vastly improved. So you can get really good resolution from the ground by using this particular technique. But it does require you to actually distort the mirror to compensate for that but there is a different way you can overcome that if you've got a bright object so you can use speckle imaging so now i'm going to go back to that animation we saw before of that star wandering around or the binary star so this is the well these are short exposure images of the binary star zeta Bootis, and this was taken with the nordic optical telescope again that's in la palma which is on the canary islands and again you can see that the two images here are very different it's the same object but the atmospheric turbulence has been captured or it's been frozen quite quickly so again with very fast imaging you can freeze that atmospheric turbulence if you take a long exposure so if you take like 10 seconds 20 seconds because your object's faint you can't capture that atmospheric turbulence because all that wandering around that the star has done the 
multiple images it's created, you just get a blur because it's all averaged out in your single image. So you need to be able to do fast imaging to freeze that atmospheric turbulence like it is here. So what do you actually do then for spatial imaging? Well, you need to take an enormous amount of images. But if your individual exposure, your individual image is a fraction of a second, you can quite quickly take lots of them. So you take thousands quite typically. So thousands and thousands of images in rapid succession, and it captures that atmospheric turbulence like you have here. Now, if you've got a single star, then it should appear as a single point. We know that if you did it in space, or with absolutely perfect seeing conditions, which is quite rare, then you sh the star should be like a point source. But we know with atmospheric turbulence, it's going to cause multiple images, it's going to move around a lot. And because of that, it's going to be almost, well, pretty much impossible to capture a binary star. So if you've got two stars next to each other, it's going to be almost impossible to resolve those due to this atmospheric turbulence, which is what that binary star we had before. So, what are we going to do? So, speckle imaging is essentially aligning all of those thousands of images and then stacking them and creating a single final image at the end, which should have better resolution, similar to what we would get with adaptive optics, or if we were reduced down that atmospheric turbulence. So, what do we mean by align? Well, what we do here is the centroid of all the images, so where the star kind of is in that particular image, it gets shifted and they are all in the same location. So you make that the center of the image, you kind of shift them all around and put them all so they're centered essentially, even though you know, they're all very different, but we take this essentially the center point of the image, the star, and center it in our image. Well, so it doesn't have to be centered provided they're all in the same location. We would then add them all and average it or stack them. So we, we typically refer to it as stacking, but we'd basically average them all and then you would get your final image. And if you do all of that, this particular binary star, so binary star Zeta Bootis, again by the Nordic Optical Telescope, which is what the animation was. After you've done all of that and with speckle imaging, this is what you get. And you can quite clearly see now that you've got two binary stars there. I mean, it's not absolutely perfect, but it's a lot better than it was originally. So this technique can be used to resolve quite small angular objects, I suppose. So if the binary stars are quite close to each other and you can overcome some atmospheric turbulence to get this sort of image here. But you can go a step further, actually. So you can do lucky imaging. So lucky imaging is a type of speckle imaging. And here, you're only using the highest quality images. Instead of using them all, we select the best ones only, and then you can get an even better image. So here you've got a triple star system, and you probably don't believe that whatsoever. This is a triple star system, and you've got a poor quality image on the left-hand side there, and that's almost completely unusable. There's clearly nothing there. It's just kind of a smudge, really, a blur. But the high quality image, you can almost pick out maybe two stars there. So here, what you actually do is you'd get rid of the poor quality ones and only use those high quality ones. And that will allow you to get a much better final image by going through the same process. So here is the uh, triple star system. This is 50,000 images stacked. So there's no alignment occurred here. This is just averaging them all out. And again, you can't see any structure there. It's all blurred, it's all averaged out, and you'd get something similar if you just did a very long exposure, basically, because you're not aligning them at all. Now, if you do speckle imaging, where you've aligned them and you've stacked them, then it starts to get a little bit better. It's still not very good, though. This is a triple star system, and we can't pick out three stars. So now what you're going to start to do is we're going to select the best ones only. So now we get rid of half of the images because they're poor quality, and we use the 50% or 50 percent of the best ones. So 25,000 of those 50,000 have now been aligned and stacked. We can now start to probably pick out three stars. There's definitely two clear ones there, and there's a faint one probably in between those two. Now we can keep going and only selecting the best, so we can go to 10% now. And you can really start to see you've got three stars starting to, pick, to come out quite nicely there. So this is 5,000 of the original 50,000 images been taken. 
And then if you go all the way down to 1% of the best images, so 500 of those 50,000 original ones taken, you can quite clearly see those three stars now. So this particular technique can be good for getting that really good angular resolution in spite of the pretty bad atmospheric turbulence that you get. Now, the downside is you can't do this for everything. You can only do this for very bright stars or very bright objects. Because you've got to do a very short exposure, you've got to do fast imaging. If you do a long exposure, then it basically just averages it out anyway. So you've got to do very fast imaging that captures that turbulence or that it basically freezes the turbulence momentarily or instantaneously and then you can use this technique but it's a very good technique for getting your better angular resolution so thank you for watching and if you have any questions or ideas for future videos then just let me know in the comments